There we go. Uh, in this portion, we're just going to briefly go over the pharmacokinetics of remifentanil, refamiliarize with, refamiliarize you with that, uh, especially in regard to uh, labor and pregnancy. Um, go over its efficacy in relation to other narcotics, to neuroaxial analgesia, and what's the safety. And then, what are some of the strategies for safe implementation of this technique at your institution, if you choose? So, <clears throat> remifentanil, uh, as you know, a very ultra-short-acting uh, mu opioid agonist, has very rapid onset, just a circulation time. Uh, it peaks in about two and a half minutes. It's broken down in the plasma into inactive metabolites, a relatively short context sensitive half-life, just over three minutes, and similarly with respiratory depression, about two and a half minutes. So the reason this was chosen is really because of sort of its safety profile. Uh, no active metabolites, it's metabolized in the plasma, it's going to go away uh, rather rapidly. Okay. So just to review the kinetics again, you have other drugs with fentanyl in the name, fentanyl, alfentanyl, sufentanyl, remifentanyl at the bottom, uh, this is just showing that if you had an infusion and it goes on for 10 hours, there's really no difference in um, how quickly it goes away because of the plasma esterases. I think, uh, unfortunately, all these drugs have fentanyl in their name, and so for the uh, labor nursing staff, sometimes these are confused. I know when we first rolled out Remy fentanyl, they were referring to it as fentanyl light, and uh, we had to explain to them and have meetings about uh, implementation and safety of remifentanil and that it wasn't just like fentanyl. So um, something to think about. So pregnancy and remifentanil. Um, the placenta itself has nonspecific esterases which break down this drug. The fetus has esterases which can break down this drug. Okay? Within five to ten minutes of turning off an infusion, there's almost no residual effect left uh, from this medication. So consequently, it's something we can use in that second stage of labor as we get close to the birth, unlike some of our other drugs, Demerol, fentanyl. Again, Demerol, having the active metabolites, we've really gone away from it in the U.S. Plasma concentrations uh, in pregnancy of remifentanil are about half those on the same weight-based dosing for non-pregnant individuals. Okay? Larger volume of distribution, a higher glomerular filtration rate, higher clearance rate. Uh, does it cross the placenta? Yes, just like uh, the other opioids, sufentanyl, fentanyl, um, there's a significant amount that crosses the placenta, but again, it is metabolized in the fetus. What data do we have? This is from the late 90s. Uh, they took um, about 16, 17 cesarean sections, they did them with epidural anesthesia, and at the time that they were starting the section, they also started an infusion of remifentanil at 0.1 mics per kilo per minute. Um, they drew uh, cord gases as well as maternal artery samples. So the part to focus on is uh, just these numbers circled in the, the red box. The um, umbilical vein to maternal artery ratio is quite high, almost 0.9. So this shows you the significant transfer of the drug from the mother to the fetus. We have the ratio of the umbilical artery to the umbilical vein. So this is a marker of how much is metabolized uh, within the child. So we have a ratio of about 0.3 there. So the majority, you can see the effect of the fetal esterases breaking down the remifentanil uh, already in the child. Cord gases, um, the cord gases are not that substantially different uh, from what you expect uh, for births without remifentanil. The CO2 is a little bit elevated from what we would expect in pregnancy. This shouldn't be surprising given that it's an opioid and we're titrating it more to effect. <clears throat> this is a study in 2010 with PCA dosing of Demerol, fentanyl, and remifentanil, okay? So uh, PCA settings for remifentanil, uh, it started with a, a 40 mic uh, dose, uh, and they had a, a lockout of every two minutes. Uh, Meperidine, 
Uh, after the initial dose, they were uh, given five milligrams every five minutes. Uh, fentanyl started with a 50 mic dose and then uh, 20 mics for each PCA hit. You can see that the uh, pain scores are not substantially different other than at one hour. And at one hour there, we have uh, lower rates of pain with the Remy fentanyl. Interestingly, with maternal satisfaction, that was actually highest uh, with the Remy fentanyl following the labor when women were asked, you know, how effective was it. We also had higher rates of uh, maternal desaturation with the Remy fentanyl uh, compared uh, to the other drugs, and the highest conversion rate to epidural was with the Demerol at almost 30 percent. Conversion rates uh, with Remy fentanyl to epidural are right around 10 percent, so it actually is quite effective. Okay? So um, we have the satisfaction rates, epidural conversions, need for supplemental oxygen. The way they did this study was if the mother's saturation fell below 95 percent, they gave them face mask oxygen. You can see a little over 10 percent of the Remy fentanyl patients required that. This would obviously depend on the dosing that you're using in the PCA regimen. Okay. Um, APGARs, no significant difference between the techniques, similar to what you would be expecting. Okay. There is a systematic review of comparisons of Remy fentanyl to meperidine. Again, we don't use meperidine that much in the U.S. because of the active metabolites and the fact that it can build up systemically in the mother, but it, it's still one of the most frequently used opioids uh, in the world, and a lot of these studies are done outside of the U.S. Uh, compared to Demerol, Remy fentanyl was superior uh, in reducing pain, again, at that one-hour mark, and is superior in maternal satisfaction scores. The point of this slide is just the variety of Remy fentanyl PCA settings uh, that have been tried in the literature and the conversion to neuroaxial analgesia. So uh, again, typically what's done is you don't have a uh, constant infusion going. It's just bolus dosing with a PCA. Okay. There have been studies done with infusions. There was a recent one that came out that really showed you actually got better pain scores with the PCA dosing rather than the continuous infusion. The other highlight is, again, conversion to neuroaxial block. In the studies that had dosing that was increased uh, by the anesthesiologist until it met the pain needs of the mother, uh, it's really around a 10% conversion rate to epidural. So it's quite effective. Okay. Side effects. Again, maternal desaturation. A significant uh, number of these women will need supplemental oxygen. Um, it's sedating probably uh, the most sedating of the uh, techniques. Nausea and vomiting was quite variable, 0 to 60 percent. Again, no notable effects on uh, APGARs, cord gases. It uh, didn't have any significant effects on the fetal heart rate tracing to the point that anyone would intervene. Okay. There's a variety of smaller studies out there comparing Remy fentanyl to neuroaxial analgesia. Uh, this is um, a typical one that I had chosen um, from 2008, 45 uh, women in this trial. Uh, you have Remy fentanyl uh, PCA dosing uh, compared to uh, dilute epidural with levobupivacaine, 0.065%. Uh, Again, you see that the epidural is much better at reducing the pain scores than the Remy fentanyl is okay, for the first hour. But if we look at satisfaction, um, it really stays about the same. The way this study was done was they actually had the women rate uh, their pain. Literally every contraction for that first hour was how they got that data and asked them about their satisfaction similarly. So and you see this over and over again in the studies. The Remy fentanyl is not as good at the pain scores as the epidural is, but as far as satisfaction, they tend to be quite similar. <clears throat> uh, another small study again, uh, Remy fentanyl uh, compared to epidurals in 2011. Uh, pain scores uh, for the first three hours significantly better with the epidural than the uh, Remy fentanyl. You see need for more maternal um, oxygen. The way this study was done is if the saturation went below 95%, they gave the mother supplemental oxygen. 
So uh, when you're looking at that left-hand column of the Remy fentanyl, the saturations really don't go below 95% because they gave them oxygen at that time. But even with that, they were significantly lower than with the neuroaxial analgesia. Okay. And then finally, uh, recently in 2013, uh, was just a, uh, a look, an observational study of Remy fentanyl PCA. They did a weight-based dosing based on a lean body mass formula. They started out at 0.15 mics per kilo. The anesthesiologist remained with the patient and then increased it stepwise until the mother said that it was effective. Okay. Two minute lockouts, no basal rate. Conversion rate to epidural, 7%. Right. You can see how the need for the remifentanyl changes. So in the first stage, during that first hour when it was initiated, around 0.4 mics per kilo were needed with each bolus. But by the time they got to the end of the first stage, it had to be increased up to about 0.7. Highest dose was around 1. Satisfaction, 93% were satisfied or very satisfied. Almost 90% would, would choose the same type of labor analgesia again. Okay. Oxygen, so almost 30% needed to receive supplemental oxygen just to keep the SATs above 92%. So I'm just curious, how many people have Remy fentanyl and have used it for labor at their hospital in their practice? So it looks like somewhere around maybe uh, a fifth or so. Okay. Does anyone use it as um, a standard for anyone who comes in? It's one of the options you give them. Fentanyl, you can have an epidural, you can have a Remy fentanyl PCA. One, two, so a handful, less than 10 certainly. So if you are going to implement this, uh, and I think it's very worthwhile, I think it's a great option, uh, there's some important consideration. So one, uh, have a standardized concentration. You don't want to have variability in this. You want to have pharmacy used to making up one set concentration of this. You want the nurses used to knowing what concentration uh, is in the bag or in the syringe on the PCA pump. Um, there have been instances when this was first rolled out where the concentrations would get mixed up. Um, have a standardized order set, whether you're still on paper or have electronic medical orders. I think it's important that it's standardized, everybody's used to it. Weight-based dosing seems to be the most effective. And also, it's definitely most effective for you to stay with the mother and titrate it to effect. And you may have to come back later on in the labor and titrate it again. Uh, to make it effective. And if you do this, this is when you get the high satisfaction scores. In a way, I think it takes much longer to institute this for the mother than it does to just place an epidural. So uh, in order for it to be effective, you really have to spend some time in the labor room with her. Typical lockouts are around two minutes. Uh, normally, basal rates are not run. There have been studies, again, with continuous infusions, but then they don't use PCA dosing. They just have an infusion. So I don't recommend a basal rate with the PCA. Uh, all your patients need to have saturation, sedation monitoring, respiratory monitoring um, uh, in order for this to be safe. Plans for supplemental oxygen. At UCSF, we actually put all our mothers on a small amount of nasal cannula oxygen with the Remy fentanyl PCA. Even though there isn't significant evidence in the literature for decreased APGARs, neonatal sedation with the Remy fentanyl, I think especially when you first roll this out to have the neonatal resuscitation team, the pediatrics, uh, the pediatricians at the delivery. And the reason is mainly just for errors that can occur when you're first starting uh, a new uh, type of analgesia. There have been case reports in the literature uh, three in the past uh, two years of maternal respiratory arrest with remifentanyl PCAs. Um, all of these had uh, good outcomes. They just needed intervention uh, with uh, bag mask ventilation uh, for the resuscitation. Okay. This is just a copy of our standardized order set. Uh, again, all these slides are going to be put on the web, so I put it up there just to give you a, a starting point. Again, we have a standardized concentration, no basal rate, preset orders for Narcan, um, 
you know, pulse oximetry, respiratory monitoring, um, plans to call anesthesia. I think this will always be something that the anesthesiologist should be involved with. This isn't like a PCA uh, that you would have on the ward for post-operative pain where the nurse is running it. Uh, only you, you want to be there when it's set up. You want to be there when it's titrated um, in order to make it both safe and effective. Okay. There's a large multi-center trial coming out of Europe um, sometime soon, hopefully later in the year. Um, they're going to look at uh, pain relief, uh, economics, uh, satisfaction, uh, maternal and neonatal side effects. Uh, this will probably be the largest study out there uh, when this comes out. So just <clears throat> a heads up, be looking for this hopefully uh, later on in 2013. Okay. So just to summarize, I think the literature certainly supports the use of remifentanil when neuroaxial block is contraindicated. As far as using it standardly on the labor ward, there's still a bit of controversy with that. Uh, one group saying that obviously if we used it more frequently, you could probably increase the safety of it. People would be more familiar with it. Um, others saying that you know, epidurals are so good uh, that uh, you know, why, why are we changes as much? But the bottom line is for uh, people that can't have epidurals because of coagulopathy uh, or other reasons, that uh, it's certainly a very viable option. Um, neonatal outcomes are very similar with neuroaxial and remifentanil analgesia. Uh, it's really more effective than the other uh, non-epidural types of analgesia out there. Although the pain scores are definitely not as good, the satisfaction rates are quite comparable. And uh, you really want to plan for the implementation. Have all the providers, labor nurses, obstetricians, anesthesiologists, undergo a little bit of training, understanding of how this drug works have a, a, a protocol for it, standardized order set, standardized medication concentration. So I think it's, uh, it's great that we have it, and it's really helped out uh, a lot of women. Thanks.